In this video, we're going to be discussing the other senses in our sensation and perception unit. So far, we've covered the visual system and the auditory system. And in this video, we're going to be talking about the gustatory system, the tactile system, the olfactory system, the kinesthetic system, and the vestibular system. The first system is the gustatory system, also known as our sense of taste. This is a chemical sense, unlike the visual system and the auditory system, which are uh, the external stimulus would be in wavelengths, whether it's uh, a sound or a sight, the light waves or the sound waves. This sense is a chemical sense. The receptors for a sense of taste are on our tongue and they're known as taste buds. And what taste buds are is they're clustered gustatory receptors located in various areas around our tongue. They each have about a 10 day lifespan and they're replaced about every 10 days. They migrate from the outside to the inside, so the outside of our tongue has the most sensation in regard to the inside of our tongue. Our inside of our tongue doesn't taste as much as the outside does. The number of taste buds and our sensitivity to taste decreases as we get older. What happens with the chemicals in something that we're tasting is that those chemicals are absorbed and dissolved in our saliva and then they trigger neural impulses that then travel to the thalamus and to the cortex and then they're processed and registered there and then sent to the other parts of the brain. Just a picture from your textbook of where the different uh, taste buds are and uh, noticing that they are located mostly on the outside of the tongue. A couple things about our gustatory system. First of all, it's debatable whether we have four primary tastes like you learned in elementary school. New research has shown us that our taste receptors actually respond to all the tastes, but they tend to specialize in one of those four basic tastes. Our sense of taste has the most sensory interaction of any other of our uh, five senses, and that means that our, our perception of flavor is very much affected by um, the smells that we have at the same time. Think about when you have a cold and you can't smell something, it doesn't taste as good as it would if you had your sense of smell. Things, even things that are spicy, they're difficult to taste when you can't smell them. And so there's a big um, thing with sensory interaction going on with this sensation. The second sense is the olfactory system. And this is also a chemical sense. And this um, also deals with chemicals that are dissolved, only this time not in saliva, but in the mucus of the nose. And we have mucus all the time, not just when we have snot. Um, the smell receptors located in the nose are called olfactory cilia, and they're hair-like structures. Now, I don't want you to think of the hairs in your nose or that you see coming out of people's noses. These are very small, microscopic, hair-like structures that are located in the upper nose that you can't see. These are also replaced um, every 30 to 60 days. They have about a 30 to 60 day lifespan. And what they do is they send that chemical information to the olfactory bulbs, which are located in the bottom of the brain, and then they send them to the other brain areas where that information is processed. Remember that the olfactory system is the only sense that is not sent to the thalamus and processed like every other sense is. This is a picture that just shows where those hair-like those hair-like cells are way high up in the nose that you can't really see and you can see those olfactory cilia there. This is also from your textbook. We're not really sure exactly how the olfactory system works because we don't have any primary odors like we have primary colors. We don't have any parallel to the retina or the basilar membrane. And we know that sensory adaptation is the strongest with our sense of smell. Think about when you walk into a room and and you walk in and you smell something very powerful or very pungent and uh, it doesn't take long for your nose to adapt to that smell and it tends to diffuse out and you don't notice it that much anymore. It's interesting that we have 10,000 different odors that are able to be distinguished by the human nose but we have a very hard time naming exactly what it is that we smell. We don't have names for all those different things that we smell but we do have over 10,000 different smells that we can distinguish. And just a, a quote here, and you can probably think about this and relate to this. 
odors or smells have the power to evoke memories and feelings very powerful ones. Just think about some time where you smelled a, a specific perfume or you smelled, for me, when I smell um, pine. It reminds me of a camp that I grew up, as, grew up at as a child and um, those powerful memories come back as a result of just simple smells that we have. Third sense that we're going to discuss here is the sense of touch or the tactile system. There's a question as to whether or not this is the most important sense that we have. We do know that touch is essential to our development. Research has shown that premature babies actually gain weight faster when they're stimulated by hand massage. Now we have to be careful with that because premature babies um, do not have as much fat underneath their skin and so they can sometimes be aggravated more by touch than um, a baby who's full grown, who's at full maturity when they're born but we do know that when babies are touched, they do develop faster and they, they get stronger faster. We also know that there are at least four skin senses that are located at various points on our skin, and those four senses are pressure, warmth, cold, and pain. We don't have any specialized receptors in our skin like we have in the rods and the cones and the hair cells and things like that. Pressure does have some identifiable receptors, but that's the only sense of touch that has identifiable receptors. So the idea that we have this sense of touch is uh, a result of the different skin sensations just that we feel. The variation of the four senses that I mentioned in the previous slide can produce a sensation um, that's different than one of the four primary ones. For example, tickling when something um, itches, when you feel something wet or you feel hot. Those are sensations that are a result of a combination of that pressure, warmth, cold, and pain creates those different sensations that we feel in our skin. And we do know that our sense of touch involves more than just tactile stimulation. The, the brain is actually involved in the sense of touch more than the other senses. The brain's most sensitive to unexpected stimulation, and think about when uh, you're being tickled. When you try to tickle yourself, it doesn't work as well as when someone else tick tickles you when it's um, more unexpected. So you're less responsive when you try to tickle yourself than when someone else tickles you. So it, it's more than just touching. Pain. Pain is your body's way of telling you that something is wrong. And it resides not only in the senses and in the skin and in our, our tactile sense, it also resides in the brain. We don't have a simple neural cord that runs from a sense organ to a definable part of the brain. And there's not one type of stimulus that triggers pain. And then we don't have any special receptors for pain. So we know that it is a product of something that's happening in the external environment, in the body, in the skin, or in an internal organ, that sort of a thing, but it's also our brain's way of responding to that. There are two pathways that run through the thalamus that deal with pain. We have the fast pathway, which is obviously going to be made up of myelinated neurons, and that fast pathway is going to relay localized or sharp pain, and it's going to relay that information in a fraction of a second. So things that are very, very important that our brain process. For example, like um, if, the, if you've cut your finger kind of thing, and, and you need to feel that and you need to sense that right away, it's going to um, send that information very quickly, and then you will jerk your hand back or whatever it is that you've cut. The slow pathway is the unmyelinated neurons, because unmyelinated neurons we know send messages um, more slowly, and they, relay, and they relay less localized pain, like aches and maybe a burning sensation, um, maybe after you've burned your hand and your fingers, it, it, you can feel that burn, or a throbbing pain, things like that. Things that are not as uh, localized, that are not as detrimental to us. The gate control theory of pain is one of the most common theories that we have in terms of how pain is perceived by the brain. There's a belief that the spinal cord contains a neurological gate that blocks pain signals or allows them to pass on to the brain. When 
pain signals are traveling up small nerve fibers, it opens up that gate to allow those messages to be sent to the brain. Activity in larger fibers closes that activity from the information that's coming back down from the brain. Going along with this gate control theory, we can control chronic pain by stimulating the gate closing in our large neural fibers. For example, when we massage a part of our body that hurts at that time, we can turn that pain message off and it doesn't hurt as much. We can um, ice something and, and reduce the inflammation and it doesn't hurt as much. Acupuncture can actually do this as well. And so can um, an electrical current going through um, the skin to a muscle. If you've ever had ultrasound done to a, a pulled muscle or something like that, it can help to control that pain. Think about when you stub your toe, and when you rub around that pain area and you create a competing stimulation, it is going to block some of those pain messages. And like I mentioned already, ice does trigger that gate closing message as well. There is a little bit of a mind over matter concept that comes into play when it comes to the gate control theory. Our pain gate can be closed by the brain by choice. We can distract that pain gate and keep it closed um, using our endorphins. There's a couple of athletes in the past that are uh, very good examples of having this happen, and maybe you've heard of other things, but Carrie Strug in the 1996 uh, Olympics in gymnastics, the video here shows it, and it shows that she com competed on the vault with a broken ankle. So just a quick example of how the brain using endorphins can shut off that pain gate just for a period of time, but then it does come back. We've talked about pain perception, that the brain actually creates pain. And pain doesn't seem as bad in hindsight. And what we've found is that the brain actually will create memory snapshots where it will record the peak moment of pain and how much pain was felt at the end but it doesn't record very accurately the duration of pain. And you notice I have a picture of a woman giving birth here, and that's one of the most painful experiences a person can go through. It's interesting how so many mothers don't accurately remember the pain that they felt while they were giving birth. Some of them do, don't get me wrong, but it, it is over very quickly, and then you're, there's a reason for it, and you're holding that child there at the end, and the pain is not as bad as what it was kind of while you were going through it. So the brain creates those perceptions. Some ways to control pain, and we've talked about a few of these things, and um, I'll just let you look at those and let you ask any questions if you have them when you return to class. The fifth system is called the kinesthetic system, and this monitors positions of our body parts through our joints and muscles. And it's just the idea that we know where our limbs are in proportion to the rest of our body. And without our kinesthetic system, we would actually be immobile. We wouldn't be able to move. I have a story about a man who, um, his name was Ian Waterman, and he had no kinesthetic system. And so if it was dark or if he couldn't see his body, he couldn't move. So once he was in bed and he turned those lights off, he was immobile until the sun came out and he could see his body again. He had to actually watch his body parts move in order to make that happen. The final system is called the vestibular system. It's our sense of balance. It's our body's, um, it senses our body's location in space and it compensates for changes in our body's position as we're moving. It's controlled by the semicircular canals in the inner ear which are filled with fluid, and they stimulate hair cells when our head moves. Now think back to the auditory system, and those hair cells in the basilar membrane, okay, that allow us to hear, but that fluid also goes into those semicircular canals in the inner ear, and there's hair cells in there as well, and it stimulates those hair cells and sends messages directly to the cerebellum which if you remember is the part of the brain that's responsible for balance and coordination, motor coordination. An example, spinning around in circles will be dizzy, we can feel dizzy until that fluid and our kinesthetic receptors return to a neutral state and then we feel like, oh yeah, we're fine. 
So this is also a system that has a lot of sensory integration. It takes more than just one sense to deal with our sense of balance. We use the other systems around us. We use the other stimuli around us in order to keep that balance going. If you've ever had vertigo or heard of someone who has vertigo, they've got, they're feeling dizzy and like they can't keep their balance and a lot of times it's due to an inner ear infection and that inner ear, the fluid in the inner ear um, is causing an inflammation which is causing that sense of balance to be um, to be messed up there a little bit. So though, that takes care of all of the different uh, senses in the body Obviously for this test, the first two, the visual system and the auditory system are the most important, but these uh, last five are also uh, important, just not quite, there's not as much that you need to know about those as you do the other two. Again, as always, if you have any questions, make sure that you write them down and bring them back to class with you and I'll be happy to answer those.